So uh, welcome everyone to this event. I'm Adam Goodhart, director of the CV Star Center at Washington College, and I'm delighted. I'll start introducing Martha while she's sort of dashing around. I'm delighted to welcome Martha Hodes um, here today. Her acclaimed new book, Morning Lincoln, over there at the, at the table, explores the reactions of ordinary people, northerners and southerners, soldiers and civilians, black and white, as they responded with sorrow, anger, fear, ambivalence, and even joy to the tragic news of Lincoln's murder in April 1865. The New York Times describes Martha Hodes' book as lyrical and important, a close and deeply disturbing study of how it seemed to Americans who disagreed with one another that Lincoln's assassination stopped the world. Uh, Martha Hodes is also one of the nation's most prominent scholars of race and gender in 19th century America. She's currently professor of history at New York University and has been a visiting professor at Princeton and a Fulbright senior scholar in Germany. Among her books is The Sea Captain's Wife, A True Story of Love, Race, and War in the 19th Century, which was one of three finalists for the Lincoln Prize, and White Women, Black Men, Illicit Sex in the 19th Century South, winner of the very prestigious Alan Nevins Prize for Literary Distinction. Uh, Martha is, is just, besides being a superb researcher, you'll find out if you, if you read her book, that she's an absolutely wonderful um, prose stylist and, and narrative writer as, as well. She's really one of the people in the profession who cares about that both for herself and, and fostering it in others too. Um, so rather than doing a formal uh, lecture today, Martha and I are going to sit here and have a, a conversation. Um, and at a certain point, we'll open it up to questions and comments from, from all of you as well. And um, I should also mention, if you are a Washington College student, and I see some Washington College students here and there in the house, at this event, um, as at all of our events this semester, you can buy a copy of Martha Hodes' book at half price for Aldo and Sarah, will you hold up that beautiful hardcover? It is a beautiful hardcover um, book. And, uh, and please don't pretend to be a student if you look like you're older than 22, because we won't, we won't <laughs> believe you. Uh, but you can still buy the book at full price, and Martha will even, will even sign it. Um, so final note, I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Washington College History Department um, for co-sponsoring the event, and also National Geographic for making those complimentary issues available. So Martha, welcome. Thank you so much, Adam, and thank you for that lovely introduction, and thank you also to Washington College and everybody who has brought me here. And I thought by starting out, you know, we're talking about what happened on April 14th, 1865, when Lincoln was assassinated, but I actually thought that since today is April 13th, it might be interesting to start with April 13th, 1865, as a way of setting the scene for what happened on the 14th. So maybe I'll tell folks a little bit about the 13th, I was reading April 13th and 14th, 1865 newspapers this afternoon in my office. So much fun to be a historian. <laughs> and, uh, and so I got a little bit of that, and then maybe you can sort of pick things up on the 14th and 15th and, and days that followed. So April 13th, the day before the assassination, was actually a day of unprecedented joy in Washington, D.C., and indeed in, in much of America. Um, of course, it was just four days after the surrender at Appomattox, and people were still rejoicing in what now seemed like the imminent, um, inevitable end of this terrible conflict that had killed three quarters of a million Americans. Um, the newspapers in Washington that day were full of news of Union victories. Selma, Alabama had fallen. Mobile had fallen. Lynchburg, Virginia had fallen. Montgomery um, was about to fall. All of these, all these places, just victory on victory, they could hardly even, even keep up with it. Um, the city fathers, the municipal, municipal authorities of Washington, had actually declared a great day of celebration in the city, that after these four terrible years, everybody was going to come out and celebrate Lee's defeat. Um, and so on April 13th in the evening, flags flew from the White House and the Capitol the windows, they did what they called an illumination in the 19th century, which means that in that era before street lights, they would light up all the buildings at night, and it was just a remarkable and spectacular thing. And so all the windows of the Capitol were lit up, all the windows of the White House, the buildings all along Pennsylvania Avenue. Bands were marching through the streets, and thousands of people were spontaneously bursting into song together, the accounts say. There was really, there was nothing like it before. Um, I actually, I, I, I found, I'll, I'll read you just 
two sentences from the newspaper the next morning, the morning of April 14th, describing the mood of this, of this city. They say, never in the history of the national metropolis was such a scene of brilliancy, beauty, and general rejoicing witnessed here so that the whole population participated last evening. Throughout the entire length of Pennsylvania Avenue and the other avenues and the streets of Washington, innumerable lights irradiated the happy and smiling faces of the, of the thousands who went forth with cheerful hearts. So that was the evening before. Now there, there were a couple of signs, there were some signs of darker undercurrents stirring, um, although these weren't necessarily in the newspapers. Now Lincoln, um, two days earlier on April 11th, had given a speech, um, what turned out to be the last speech of his life, an extraordinarily important speech, in which he began to lay out his, his plans for reconstruction, um, including saying that he believed in extending the privilege of voting to at least some African Americans. So on the 13th, the city's biggest newspaper, the Daily National Intelligencer, and just as a way of telling you how, how much of a sea change there had been in American politics, this newspaper four years earlier carried ads for slaves. And now in 1865, it's praising the speech to the skies and saying it's great and good. And it, finally it says, and this is kind of chilling in retrospect, the speech is to be hailed with delight by almost the unanimous voice of the people south as well as north. But that was not the case because one of the people listening to that speech was a young actor, John Wilkes Booth, standing there in the crowd and was later reported as having said, this speech means Negro citizenship, although he didn't use the word Negro. And it's said that that was the moment when he really decided that he was going to do what he did on the, on the 14th. So I wanted to set the stage a little bit. And, and Martha, maybe you can, you can pick up from there and tell us how did the news change on the 14th and 15th? Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I will add just to the scene you were talking about that the companion standing with John Wilkes Booth followed up that statement with the words, now by God, I'll put him through. So it really was a direct reference to saying, you know, he mentioned suffrage rights for black men, now I'm going to follow through on this plan and murder him, which he did. So on April 14th, Abraham and Mary Lincoln had tickets to go to the theater. They were going to see a play called Our American Cousin, which was a comedy about a backwoods cousin who was going to visit relatives uh, in Europe. And it was said that Lincoln was quite tired and exhausted and needed something light to do. And he and Mary had invited various people to go with them. And a number of people had turned down the invitation, including Secretary of, uh, Sec Assistant Secretary of War Thomas Eckert and his spouse, and including General Grant and his wife, Julia. So with the Lincolns were a young couple, Clara and Henry, Henry Rathbone and Clara Harris. Uh, she was the daughter of a senator, and he was her stepbrother and fiance. They entered the theater uh, at about 10.15. They made their way to the seats. The band stopped. Now, theater in the 19th century was a little bit different, so the orchestra stopped playing when the Lincolns entered. They, the band struck up a tune, Hail to the Chief. People applauded, Lincoln took a bow, and he made his way up to the, the presidential box. John Wilkes Booth was a seasoned actor. He knew Ford's theater. He knew the play. He knew exactly when there was going to be a particular laugh line. And during that line, not only would any sound be obscured, but there was only one person on the stage. So he had planned this very well. At that moment, the laugh came, and that's when he fired the shot into the back of Lincoln's head. Booth knew the theater well, so he had arranged with, by setting up certain uh, uh, he had put a peephole in the box, he had put a wedge in the door so nobody could open it from behind, and people had let him into the theater because he was a well-known actor. He fired the shot, and then of course he jumped to the stage and shouted, Six Semper Tyrannus, or that's what some people heard, not everybody heard the same words. Lincoln never regained consciousness. Uh, Henry Rathbone stood up and said, and there's a famous picture of him standing up with his arm raised, he said, stop that man. Booth slashed his arm, Mary Lincoln thought that all of that blood was Lincoln's blood, she was screaming, and then Lincoln was carried out of the theater by a group of men across the street to Peterson's boarding house, 
which was the closest place they could lie him down. The White House was too far away. And there he lay through the night and expired at 7.22 the next morning. And of course, the telegraph wires began to run. And that's the beginning of the spread of the news. As soon as Booth jumped to the stage and left the theater through a back alley, people were for a moment frozen in shock. And then they began to rush outside, rush out of the theater, and that's how the news began to spread. What was the scene like in, in Washington that evening for the rest of the, for the, rest of the night? And this is, you know, I, I always try to also picture this city as a place without much artificial light, and these events were sort of happening in, in darkness. It must have been just uncanny. It was completely chaotic. Um, soldiers rushed into the theater, they had their bayonets, People were rushing out, trying to spread the word. People were also fearful for the lives of other statesmen, and so they were running to the homes of other government officials and telling them, don't leave your house. But of course, then those government officials wanted to be with Lincoln, so they left the house anyway. They ran to Peterson House. African Americans began gathering right away, completely distressed at the news, um, continually asking people who were in positions of authority what was going on with the president. Um, in Peterson House, uh, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton was already conducting an investigation into the assassination. John Wilkes Booth had escaped on horseback before Washington had sealed the city borders. So he was gone and it would be two weeks till he was found. But nobody knew if other people were set to be assassinated. And in fact, other people were set to be assassinated. So there was one conspirator who had broken into the, uh, the home of Secretary of State uh, William Seward and had tried to murder him, slash him to death. but was then wrestled out of that, uh, the, the lock he had on Seward and ended up you know, not, not completing his mission. Somebody was supposed to assassinate Vice President Andrew Johnson, but he chickened out and was having a drink in a hotel bar somewhere. So there was, there was a, the, the, the people who were afraid were, were right to be afraid, although nobody else was murdered that night. And it's amazing, I mean, I think they're, one of the interesting things about that assassination is that we do focus on that moment of John Wilkes Booth, the lone gunman stepping out and firing his pistol, um, which uh, incidentally, it was, a, it was a single shot Derringer. It was this tiny, I don't know, if, have any of you seen this in Ford's theater? It's a, it's a tiny little thing. It was um, not the weapon that I would have chosen to assassinate someone. You really only get one, one shot. It was actually known as the kind of pistol that gamblers kept at card games so that if anybody tried to um, cheat them at cards, they could sort of pull this little gun out without anyone knowing what was there and just plug them across the card table. Um, but anyway, you know, we focus on that moment of Booth, the lone gunman, stepping out. And I think that our understanding of that event is so shaped by later assassinations, later presidential assassinations that were all these sort of lone gunmen who were mentally disturbed to one degree or another. And we forget the conspiracy aspect of things. We forget the way that this um, really was a political plot and one that may even to one degree or another have been um, if not ordered, but at least something that was, that was being supported by um, some of the highest levels of the Confederate government, something that's still unclear due to the, due to the destruction of a lot of Confederate records at the end of the, at the, end of the war. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the most interesting things. But still, um, where you pick up in your, in your book, Morning, Morning Lincoln, is you pick up after that part of the story. Um, and that's the extraordinary thing with all the books about the assassination, there's never really been a book about the aftermath before. And so I wonder, first of all, what motivated you to write about the reaction? You're absolutely right that there are many, many books about Lincoln and about the assassination, but the standard line is the nation was a nation in mourning at this moment, which isn't entirely untrue, but it is specifically untrue in that not everybody was mourning Lincoln. Well, I've been teaching the Civil War for over 25 years, and I always have said something about Lincoln. Um, I began to research this book about five or six years ago, and I realized later, after I was in the middle of my research, that I had been motivated to write the book because I had been in New York City on the morning of September 11th, 2001, and I had seen the second plane hit the tower as I was on my way to school. It was the first day of classes at NYU, and when I thought back on that day, during the process of writing Morning Lincoln, I remembered 
a world grieving and in shock. And I remembered a world that had come to a halt. And then the next morning, September 12th, 2001, I had left my apartment in the village and I had walked through the streets taking pictures of signs and shrines. People had written handwritten signs and they pasted them up and they surrounded everything with flowers. And I had taken pictures of these scenes and I went back and looked at those pictures and what I realized was there was already all kinds of tension among people who were responding to 9-11. So there were people who were writing signs for peace. There were people who were defacing those signs and saying, you know, we need to take revenge. There were people who were then defacing in turn those signs and saying revenge without war. And the same was actually true. I was only five years old when Kennedy was assassinated, but looking back at the news at that time, there were extra policemen called out in Dallas. There were fistfights that broke out in bars because people said something against Kennedy and mourners were very angry. So what I realized when I was writing Morning Lincoln and the evidence was pointing to all of this was how varied the responses are and how those responses in many ways mirrored the tensions and contentions in the nation at the moment of victory and defeat. So what were those uh, responses? Tell us about that contention. Well, the first and most common response and the one that we all think of is shock and grief. And that was certainly true, absolutely widespread people wrote in their journals and letters that they were stupefied and they felt as if uh, they had heard a clap of thunder in a clear blue sky. That was something they often, uh, often brought up, <clears throat> metaphors of thunder. People were terribly aggrieved. Men were weeping in the streets. I found so many records of men weeping that I made it a separate section of the book. Men wrote themselves, you know, I was wiping my eyes walking down the street. Women would say things like, my husband could not hold back the tears or the clergyman tried to get through his sermon but he was not able to and tears were rolling down his cheeks. So that was very interesting to me. Um, people were confirming the event by looking into one another's faces. Uh, when Kennedy was assassinated, people gathered around appliance stores and watched television. If you didn't have a television at home, if you did, the first thing you did was turn on the television. At 9-11, you turned on your television. It wasn't the era of smartphones yet, but you looked at your cell phone, you called people. 1865, the way to confirm some disastrous, cat catastrophic event, you went out of the house and you looked into someone's eyes. And if you saw a stricken face, if you saw tears, if you saw furrowed brows, you knew this was probably going to be true. But the other side of this is that not everybody was mourning. And in particular, Lincoln's antagonists had a very different response to the assassination. So Confederates considered the assassination a sign from God. They were unsure why God had permitted the Confederacy to lose the war. Now they felt they had a signal from God that something might go their way. They looked at the assassination as a moment of reprieve from the horror of defeat for them. And Lincoln also had enemies in the North, the members of the Northern Democratic Party, the Copperheads, who despised him and hated his war. And that even included some Union soldiers who had been conscripted, who were fighting for Union but not against slavery. And many of these people, so both Confederates and Copperheads, they clapped, they cheered, they laughed, they cursed Lincoln, they said all kinds of terrible things about him, which of course terribly dismayed mourners. So there you have that tension and contention out on the streets. Can you give us a specific example of some of the things that people said in glee at that moment? Yeah, the example, one of the examples I always like to talk about is um, a young white woman in South Carolina who was in the middle of her German lesson. She was from a slaveholding family. And somebody came in and broke the news. She recounted this event in her diary. And she wrote in her diary, hurrah, old Abe Lincoln has been assassinated. And then she described, with an exclamation point, and then she described leaving her German lesson, flying home, stopping off at her aunt's house. And there she said, Everyone was in a tremor of excitement, excitement meaning happiness. And then she wrote, isn't it splendid mm. uh, in, her, in her diary? And there are actually quite a few, um, there are quite a few diary entries like that. Uh, I'll just give one, one more example. Um, a real diehard rebel, uh, a lawyer from Jacksonville, Florida, Rodney Dorman, who I follow through the book, I follow his responses through the book. Uh, he hated Lincoln, he despised Lincoln. And he wrote, uh, he wrote a long passage saying that assassination wasn't even what should have happened to Lincoln. He should have been publicly hanged. Only that would have been better. And he was so happy that these evil monsters, Lincoln and Seward, he thought Seward had also been assassinated at that point, that they had been removed from the earth. You know, um, 
uh, it's interesting too because when you read the later accounts, um, almost all of the accounts that I've written that I've read that were written after the fact in in later years, all talk about how the Southerners, the white Southerners, were joining in the morning, and that they knew that they knew that their best friend in the Union government had just been killed, and and even there's an account uh, of Jefferson Davis uh, who said the South has lost its its best friend. Um, but you made the interesting decision, and I wonder if you could talk about it a little bit, to not read anything, really, that was written after 1865, right? Right. So let me just say a few things about that. Um, I thought that the best friend narrative was something that happened later when the lost cause narrative became prominent in the later 19th and early 20th centuries. But what is so fascinating is that at the same time that Confederates are expressing glee over Lincoln's assassination, they're also worried because they consider him their best friend. So these two things are going on simultaneously. The other point I wanted to make in response to what you just said, Adam, is that even the mourners who see around them copperheads celebrating or clapping or cheering, they still write in their letters and journals, North and South are weeping together. So it's mm. that kind of instinct where you just feel in this terrible moment that everyone is doing what you're doing and feeling what you're feeling. But the point you bring up is a very good one. I decided in the book not to use memoirs as a source. And I decided that because memoirs are crafted, they're rewritten, and although every source is crafted in some ways, a letter or a diary, the memoirs about Lincoln's assassination are especially problematic, and I'll just give two examples. The first is, I mentioned before that when Lincoln was shot, he was carried out of the theater across the street to the Peterson boarding house. Well, between that moment and the next generation, an impossible number of men claimed in their memoirs to have been the ones who carried Lincoln out of the theater, more than could ever have fit around his body. I don't even think those people were lying or being self-aggrandizing. It's that memories shift and change, and if you were anywhere nearby, or let's say you were walking by the people who were carrying him out, then you would remember that you had been there and you had been the one carrying the stretcher. Um, the other example comes from a Union soldier diary that was in one of the archives I found. So there was an original diary, and then when this veteran grew to be an old man, he typed up the diary and added in um, he filled in the story, let's say. So in the diary, it said something like, I was in the Union Army Hospital. Lincoln came by and saw all of us sick soldiers, you know, something like that. So Lincoln had walked by and maybe nodded at the men. Then about 30 years later, when this veteran is writing up the story, he embellishes it tremendously. Mm. He says, Lincoln shook my hand. He spoke both to the Union and Confederate soldiers politely. He shook their hands, too. So the narrative he was giving us 30 years later was really a lost cause narrative. In other words, the uniting of white Northerners and white Southerners, that Lincoln loved the South as well as the North. And I, of course, it could have been true, but I decided right then that it wasn't um, something I could do to trust these sources that, have been, that had been crafted so long afterwards. And you know, it's. One place where our, our work on this diverges, not in the sense of disagreement, but um, in your fantastic book, you're interested in focusing on what was being said in 1865. In my own much more modest article about Link, following Lincoln's um, funeral train's journey um, that I did for National Geographic, I was actually really interested especially in what happened since 1865 and the legacy of that, of that moment. And I do think that um, it's significant the way that people use that as a touchstone for national unity. Um, it was something that everyone could sort of subscribe to. And when the formerly seceding white Southerners were sort of ready to become Americans again, one of the things that they embraced as Americans was that idea that this was a tragedy. At least some of them did, not everyone, not everyone um, ever, ever did. But I think one of the reasons it's fascinating is that we've had, you mentioned 9-11, the Kennedy assassination. We've had so many moments like that since then, unfortunately, moments of shared national tragedy, of shared national sort of simultaneous experience that I think it's not just people of the Civil War era, but to all of us today, part of what makes us feel especially American is 
feeling like we experienced 9-11 together or older folks knowing that they experienced the Kennedy assassination together. I'm still amazed how, you know, 14 years after 9-11, how little it takes in a conversation with a group of people to get people starting to tell stories about where was I, where was I on that day? You know, in this country where we're not the same ethnicity, we're not the same religion, um, we don't have the same family histories, and we don't have the same politics, and yet those become, those tragic moments become our touchstones. In fact, Lincoln's death became a sort of a, a dress rehearsal, almost literally, because later presidential, assassinated presidential funerals consciously reenacted Lincoln's. It becomes a ritual of national, national belonging. Maybe that's why so many people also claim that they were in that, in that room uh, where Lincoln died, which I, uh, some people have called it the rubber room, because it was so. Um, actually, I, I, have a, I have a Courier and Ives print from 1865 that belonged to my grandmother, and it's of Lincoln's deathbed, the death of President Lincoln. And it shows like 50 people, like the whole family, the whole cabinet, everybody's gathered around the deathbed, sort of weeping. And um, you know, I, you go to the Peterson house. I was there with my students a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, I and my four students could barely fit into that, into that tiny room. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Adam, your article in National Geographic is so beautiful. And I hope everybody here reads it. I absolutely loved it. It, it is, you're right, quite a different take. Um, and I think it goes really well, in a way, with Morning Lincoln. Um, what's so interesting to me is when we think about these events that we imagine as universal, I think it's important for us to remember that they weren't necessarily universal at the moment. And it may sometimes be that the people we talk to or the people we communicate with, say, over social media, are usually people, of our, people we agree with in different ways. And so after something like Ferguson, Missouri, to me, it felt like the whole world was protesting. Mm -hmm. But really, I'm quite sure that wasn't the case. Um, we don't often hear the other side. And that explained to me a little bit, uh, I don't mean the other side as the other side being equal, but dissenting voices from what, what we may think. And so that, in a way, explains why people would write something in their diary uh, in 1865 saying North and South are weeping together, or Lincoln knew no North, no South, only his country, because it feels like that at the moment. And yet, really, there's all kinds of conflict going on. Well, there were actually, um, there were acts of violence and there were arrests, weren't there? I, I, that was a part of the story that really doesn't, doesn't get talked about. And I'm, we're not just talking about the arrests of the conspirators, we're talking about arrests of others. Can you tell us about that? Yes, that was very interesting to me as well. So especially with regard to Copperheads, that is the Northern Democrats who despise Lincoln, and especially among the soldiers. So these men um, who would, laugh or clap or cheer when they got the news, uh, infuriated their comrades who were, who were devastated by Lincoln's assassination. And as it turned out, they could be brought up on charges of treason. Being accused of being what was called an accessory after the fact, which is probably not something we would tolerate today. And the reason we know about all of these responses, these gleeful responses to the assassination on the part of Union soldiers is because there's testimony that was written out. And that testimony is preserved in the National Archives. And you can see there was a court, there was a military tribunal, and witnesses were asked, you know, what did this soldier say? What did these men say? And they wrote out all the words they said. Some of them were joking. There was one man who said uh, that after Booth shot Lincoln, he has as much of a brain now as he ever had. So that was um, sacrilegious to people who were mourning him. They were infuriated. Also in prisons, Confederate prisoners were um, watched very closely, and if they made any sort of uh, statement of satisfaction, the prison guards would permit the Union soldiers to treat them with violence, so it was kind of extra legal violence. Um, they might be dunked in a pond until they almost drowned. They might be strung up in a very uncomfortable way from their fingers. So there really was um, quite a bit of informal violence, and not just in the army. That also happened in towns and cities and villages. If somebody, there was an incident in a New England town of a woman walking down the street laughing after she got the news, and people threatened to tar and feather her, and she had to flee. And then, of course, the experience for African Americans was so interesting, and in some ways, um, similar to many white northerners in the sense of grief, but it was a really a, a kind of an acute um, grief and a, an acute sense that Lincoln was there 
president, and that was recognized, and it was even it was even honored by a lot of white Americans at the time. They would they would write about um, these these black people who came out to watch the funeral. There's one account, um, and I think it's in it's in the New York Times. Um, of an elderly African American woman who was standing on on Broadway watching the Lincoln funeral procession pass by as it made its 1600 mile route through the the Union states, the Northern states. And um, she said, God bless him, God bless him, he died for me. Mm -hmm. So there was that very immediate sense of of personal loss. But then there was also, there was another side to it. um, And that can be maybe best conveyed also by something that happened that day in New York City. Um, and this was when, by way of background, um, as some of you probably know, after Lincoln's assassination, um, his body, his coffin body, first um, lay in state in the, in the White House, then lay in state in the Capitol, and then was sent on a special train, a 1600 mile journey um, up through New York State, along the Great Lakes, down through the Midwest, and ultimately back to Lincoln's hometown of Springfield, Illinois, where where he would be, he would be buried, um, and at various stops along the route, um, his body would be taken off of the train in its coffin, and paraded through the streets in funeral processions, and then put in a public place where people could file by and look into the open coffin and look at Lincoln's face. And it said that over a million Americans saw Lincoln's face. So there was a sense of participation. Well. For African Americans in New York City, it didn't quite work out that way because they planned, 5,000 black New Yorkers planned to march in the great funeral procession with tens of thousands of other people following Lincoln's um, funeral um, cortege through the streets of, of New York. And the New York City authorities said that they weren't allowed to march. Um, and the reason that they gave was so that there wouldn't be any disturbance, you know, which sounds a little familiar from our own times about the idea of African Americans gathering in, in public to, to participate in things. But um, when Stanton, the Secretary of War, heard about this in Washington, he quickly sent a telegraph to New York saying, you are under orders, let black people participate in this along with everyone else. But by that point, there had already been such intimidation that only a few hundred African-American New Yorkers participated and they brought up the very rear of this procession. They were sort of stragglers behind the procession. So a very poignant moment and a moment that sort of foreshadowed what would happen to African-Americans after Lincoln's death um, and, and looking into the years of reconstruction ahead. And the other point that goes with what you're saying, Adam, is that in these, um lines in which people would file by the coffin in all of these cities, African Americans were often relegated to the back of those lines. What's interesting is that white mourners did concede that it was a tragedy that was greater for African Americans than for themselves. They were willing to admit that. Um, And of course, African Americans had been critical of Lincoln during the war because he had been quite slow to act on emancipation. But by the time he was assassinated, the Emancipation Proclamation had come along, the second inaugural, a very important address in which Lincoln made the point that the war was fought about slavery. And then, of course, the April 11th speech that you mentioned in which Lincoln suggested that black men who, as he put it, the very intelligent and those who serve our cause as soldiers, at least, should be granted the vote. So there was a real sense um, that Lincoln had been deeply influenced by African Americans as well as by white abolitionists, that he was their president and that he would have seen through Reconstruction would have seen them through Reconstruction in a way that did not happen with Andrew Johnson. And African Americans knew that really right away, that that without Lincoln, um, there was going to be a diminishment of their rights. I have a feeling that somebody in the audience is going to ask the question that almost always gets asked of what would have happened had Lincoln had Lincoln lived. So I'll save that. But before opening it, it up to um, folks here, I have one uh, question for you and then one short comment story of, of my own, or a two-part story, actually. So first I'll ask you, you know, here we are at Washington College. I think we've actually got George Washington's signature looming up there above our head. So, you know, we, we definitely revere George Washington here, but we may be a little bit unusual in that, because I feel like in much of America, Washington seems like this sort of distant marble god, and Lincoln somehow is carried in 
and I feel like I'm going to get struck by lightning or something <laughs> right now. But I do, feel, I do feel like Lincoln is carried in people's hearts in a way that no one else in American history quite is. And then in some ways the years haven't even diminished that. We already, already see, I think, how Kennedy for a younger generation of Americans who weren't around for the assassination. Well, people know that he supposedly slept with Marilyn Monroe and people you know, know about a few, you know, the Bay of Pigs and a couple of things, but, but Lincoln, it just seems like we always come back to. And I wonder, I wonder why you think that is, if you could talk about that. I'll respond by talking about some of the ways that mourners compared Lincoln. So Lincoln was compared to George Washington. That was a comparison, though, that was made by white mourners. And the difference, of course, was that Washington had been a slaveholder. So African Americans did not make that comparison. After Washington, mourners compared Lincoln to Moses. And that was very um, prominent in black communities, but also among white mourners. And then last, partly because Lincoln was shot on Good Friday, he was also compared to Jesus. And that was both black and white mourners. Um, but I do think you're right that Lincoln holds a, a certain place in our hearts that has to do with the, um, the turning point of the Civil War in American history. It was, in a way, the event that created the nation that the American Revolution failed to create because secession was possible and because African Americans had been excluded from the mission of freedom of the revolution. Um, but I also think the Kennedy point is really interesting here, Adam, because people thought of, of Abraham Lincoln as their father, Father Abraham. Kennedy, if you yeah. read the letters to Jackie, for example, that are collected in a wonderful book, people thought of Kennedy as a brother or a son. Mm -hmm. So there was a way in which Kennedy was even closer to people's hearts, but people really did love Lincoln, and they wrote about loving him, and they wrote about the fact that they didn't just call him Father Abraham, but people wrote things like, I felt as if my own father had died. One former slave said, I felt as if both my mother and father had died at the same time. And people really wrote about him as a friend and a relative and an intimate. And that has to do with, I think, Lincoln's genius as a statesman and a diplomat. You know, when you say that, it's amazing because that article that I um, was talking about, about Lincoln's speech, one thing that I didn't quote was they said it was a speech both paternal and fraternal. Yeah, so they were thinking of him, the brother and the father, right on, literally on the eve of his assassination. It was in the newspapers that day. Um, so I, I had one um, last point um, to make, just because I had to, I had to um, tell a, a couple of things um, because of some proximity. One is that um, there's actually a Washington College professor who's mentioned um, in my article, although he's unfortunately not mentioned by name, but he's here with us, Dr. Bennett Lamond, who many of you no, and um, the reason that Bennett is mentioned in this story is that something that Bennett told me years ago before I was working on this, maybe even before I was writing about the Civil War, stayed with me. And that was Bennett told me that he remembers as a young boy, so this would have been the 1980s, right, Bennett? <laughs> <laughs> he, Bennett, remem Bennett remembers as a, as a young lad being told by his grandfather about seeing Lincoln's funeral procession pass that day down Broadway. I just heard that and said, wow, this history is not so very far away. And the second thing I have to tell to illustrate that that also blew me away was much more recent. Um, last Friday, I spoke, um, I, I moderated a panel in the room where Lincoln drafted the Emancipation Proclamation in Washington, drafted much of the proclamation. It's a, an amazing historic site called President Lincoln's Cottage at the Soldier's Home. So I'm sitting there, which is mind-blowing enough, in this room for a few hours where he drafted the proclamation. Afterwards, um, an older gentleman in the audience comes up and introduces himself, and he said, I really enjoyed that presentation. And I also wanted to mention to you, I am the son of a slave. I said, wait a minute, son, you don't, look that, you don't look like you were born in the 1860s. He said, my father was born on a plantation in Virginia in 1862, and I was born in 1932, when my father was 70 years old. Yeah. I have a picture of this on Facebook, of me with this man. I just, it, it gives me chills even now to talk about it, but, but this, this history is, is still... 
touching us. So um, maybe we can hear some questions and, and thoughts from people here. I'll do oh. that. Yeah. And I'll hold up your, yeah. On your phone, yes. <laughs> so don't be shy. Surely, uh, yes, Dr. McCall. Uh, how did other countries react? Did the British throne uh, send regrets, or how about was the reaction completely in Europe? Mm -hmm. Martha, would you like to? There's a wonderful book. It's an enormous book that compiles all the official condolences that were sent to the United States. It's everything from all the governments of Europe to all across the world, to working men's associations, uh, women's sewing circles. Um, so all, all across the world, people sent official condolences and regrets, and they're really beautiful letters. But one thing that's really interesting, you mentioned Britain, so I'll just say something about this. In the course of my research, I read the diaries and letters of Charles Francis Adams, who was the minister to London during the Civil War and in 1865. And Charles Francis Adams would go to these dinner parties of well-to-do upper-class Brits who were quite sympathetic to the Confederacy. And he, was, he would write in his diary how disgusted he was by their responses. In other words, they weren't people, weren't cheering that Lincoln was assassinated. Some were, but not everybody. But they were worried about Jefferson Davis, and that really angered Charles Francis Adams. So once again, you have the official condolences saying one thing, not necessarily untrue, but then all kinds of other responses. And Charles Francis Adams, uh, Adams also saved um, anti-Lincoln dog girl that he received. Um, he received a poem that he kept with his papers about Lincoln becoming Satan and descending to hell. So you really see the variety of responses when you move away just from the, from the official diplomatic condolences. There, there is a beautiful um, note from Queen Victoria to Mary Todd Lincoln um, where she's speaking. Of course, Queen Victoria had lost her absolutely beloved husband, Albert, in 1861. Um, and so she's writing sort of just as one woman to another, as one bereaved widow to another, it's a, it's a beautiful note. What, but perhaps more surprising, um, one of the strong expressions of, of sympathy came from ruler of sort of one of the least democratic nations in the world at that point, um, Tsar Alexander II of, of Russia, who also felt an odd kinship with, with Lincoln that a lot of people have forgotten. And Alexander, um, several years earlier, had freed the Russian serfs. And he and Lincoln um, wrote to each other and sort of admired each other during the Civil War because they both knew what a struggle it was um, trying to take this progressive step despite the vested interests of the, the landed aristocracy in their, in their country. So yeah, Lincoln resonated in all sorts of ways. There's, a, there's another, there's a wonderful um, description by Tolstoy um, where he talks about visiting a remote area of the, of the Caucasus um, later in the 19th century. And he was meeting with this, tribes, this tribal chief um, sitting around a, a, a fire. Um, and this tribal chief is asking him for news of the outside world and says, tell us about this great man Lincoln of whom we have heard speak. No. No. Yes. how soon after the battles of Lexington and Concord, the news was, was known as far away as Charleston and Savannah, within two weeks. How soon did the uh, word of the Lincoln assassination get to the frontiers, and particularly in the South, where the uh, telegraph system was, had been pretty much destroyed? Exactly. So. Where the telegraph lines ran, news was within hours. So the news would, the telegram would go through the lines and then the journalists would go to the telegraphy offices and then they would print up, they would not only take the telegrams and read them, but they would also print up the newspaper headlines. So that morning, for example, the morning of Saturday, April 15th, San Francisco already had word within hours. That was very interesting to me because there was a telegraph there. Um, and the telegram, in San Francisco, I have this from a personal account, a diary that day, the telegram was read from the, foot, from, the, from the steps of the telegraph office with a crowd standing around it. But um, there were many places in the United States where the telegraph didn't run, and much of the southern system of communications had been disrupted by the war. So what's really interesting was, um, it was very interesting for me to follow the way rumors began to spread where the telegraph didn't run 
So perhaps somebody would write something in a letter and then word would spread, or a government official would get a notice and then maybe say something to some of the men. And the rumors that spread were everything from Lincoln has been assassinated to um, Lincoln and his son, Tad, have been assassinated, Andrew Johnson has been assassinated, um, and then the rumors began to be the Confederacy hasn't really surrendered, and Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, and all, you can just see the way um, in an era where communications was considered to be instantaneous through the telegraph, rumors were faster than the telegram. Um, the South, New Orleans, for example, took about a week, maybe four or five days, to get to New Orleans. Um, and then parts of the country, parts of Utah Territory, didn't hear the news for maybe a month or so. I think the latest places to get the news were outside of the US. June was China and Australia. So, and I think um, Britain was about two weeks because the newspapers had to be carried over on a boat. The cables didn't go under the Atlantic yet at that point. Um, one of the stories about the news um, reaching that, that I found really, really striking, and, and it's actually it's in the first chapter of the book I'm writing now, um, but one of these remarkable, coincid uncanny coincidences of, of the history of that week is that April 14th, 1865 was also the fourth anniversary of the surrender of Fort Sumter, which started the, started the Civil War. April 12th. April you're right, it was April, it was April 12th. But, yeah. but they were celebrating, but they were on, celebrating the on the 14th. That's exactly, exactly right. Yeah. I should know that, Martha. You know that. <laughs> it's been a while since I read my own book. <laughs> um, so they were celebrating, on the, on the 14th, they were celebrating um, the anniversary. I guess the 14th was the evacuation. The 12th was the, yeah, the 12th was the attack. The 13th was the end of the attack, and the 14th was the evacuation. So they were celebrating the anniversary of the actual evacuation of, of Fort Sumter that day, and what they did was they sent a huge delegation of northern leaders down to Charleston, which had fallen to the Union forces several weeks earlier. And this was the sort of like all-star team of the abolitionists, Henry Ward Beecher, William Lloyd Garrison, there were various um, northern generals, Major Robert Anderson, who had, who had surrendered the fort, all went down on, on steamboats went to Fort Sumter and they raised above Fort Sumter the same flag that had been lowered in 1861. Um, and literally within hours of that flag being raised, Lincoln was, Lincoln was shot. Well, that group of people, they spent a few days in Charleston touring around, uh, meeting newly freed slaves, exulting in victory. Then they boarded their steamers and they headed back up north and um, before they went back to New York, they stopped at, at Fort Monroe, Virginia, at the mouth of the, of the Chesapeake, where some people were getting out. And as they were coming up to Fort Monroe, and they'd been just whooping it up the entire trip back, um, a little launch comes out, and someone in the boat shouts across the water, President Lincoln is killed, and it just immediately turns into terrible mourning. That's exactly right. I think we read the same source on this. It's a Probably wonderful, so. wonderful source. Yep. Yeah. More questions? Comments. Uh, yes. What is it about Lincoln? I'm always fascinated in this day of degrees and uh, respect for education. What not? He, being a self-educated person, largely, would, was able to garner so much respect and admiration. As a self-educated, as a self-educated. What, what makes him? Or what allowed him? To so admired and I mean he had no title. Well, he was really Yeah, I think that I think that every man quality was part of his appeal and from his from really from his entry into national politics, um, he was known as as the rail splitter. And this wasn't new in American politics, certainly. You know, William Henry Harrison, who, who grew up actually in a fairly wealthy Virginia family, was also sort of extolled as he was the first log cabin um, candidate in eighteen in 1840. Um, but Lincoln really had a special sympathy, I think, for those who were, who were poor, who were disenfranchised, who were struggling. And, and he spoke um, from very early on, I mean, from the first weeks of the Civil War. Um, in fact, in a, in a speech that he gave on his way to Washington, a speech that he gave in, in Philadelphia before his inauguration, he stopped at Independence Hall on George Washington's birthday. And another, another uncanny Lincoln story. Um, he, 
at dawn stands at Independence Hall, raises the American flag over Independence Hall. It was actually, Kansas had just been admitted as a state and he was raising the 34 star flag for the first time above Independence Hall. And he talks about the Declaration of Independence. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, the document that was written in this building was not a mere statement of political union. Um, this was a compact that freedom of freedom for the entire world um, and of a movement to um, lift the weights from all shoulders to give to all an even chance in life, words he would later adapt in his more famous message to Congress. And he said, rather than giving up fighting for that principle, he said, that is what we are fighting for. Rather than, fighting, than giving up fighting for that principle, I would rather be assassinated on this spot. But I, I will add one point to that in response to that very interesting question, which is that there were people, the people who despised Lincoln, who drew on the fact that he was uneducated yes. as a way to make fun of him. And so often in the Confederate writings, even after he's assassinated, he's often called a buffoon, an uneducated fool. The original gorilla, they call Yeah, it, lots yeah. of references to he was an ape, Uncle Abe, the ape, that was a common phrase. Um, so people also drew on that in a non-admiring way, and I think it's important to remember that in tandem with, with yes. what you were talking about. Yes. See, I, I'm always the optimist, and you're the pessimist. I'm pessimist. You're like, <laughs> we I'm balance the, each other I'm out. the multi-vocal person. <laughs> yes, I want, you I want are. the whole deal of voices. Yeah, yeah. You are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, this gentleman's had his hand up for a while. Uh, in her uh, book, The Republic of Suffering, I think... Mm. Gilpin Faust talks about the number of bodies that were, uh, that were buried, obviously, and some unidentified, and the State Department, the War Department, would write letters back to the family to the extent they could identify the body, often with a contrived message that they died in the arms of their best friend, or they were comforted, and their last word was mother, uh, something to that effect. What I'm wondering, in those bodies that were not returned, maybe Adam, you made that comment in your geographic article, was it? The funeral procession, a national way for those soldiers who didn't come back and for their families to mourn specifically those individuals uh, when they didn't perhaps have the ritual of, uh, of a funeral or a memorial. Yeah. This became something very special to those families. Yeah, that's one of the, yeah one of the most poignant things that um, that I found as I as I traveled on this funeral route was feeling just how how small many of these towns um, were and and are and yet how much the, how many people they had sacrificed to the war effort um, and you know in fact in the town of of Lincoln Illinois it was even it was named for Lincoln in fact while he was a state legislator in the 1850s the first place in America named for Lincoln but it's a little sleepy county seat, and you go into the main courthouse square of, of Lincoln, and there's this enormous obelisk that's just carved with all of these names of, of local boys and local men and, and the places where they, where they died um, fighting. You say, my gosh, this was just, it was, a, it was a massacre. It was a slaughter, and not just for the nation, but for these communities, for these families, and these tight-knit communities where everyone knew each other. Um, so, yeah, so I do think that, that there was a, a point at which these deaths became almost routine um, and the bodies weren't always coming back. And so people used that um, moment of mourning Lincoln as a chance to mourn loved ones much closer to home. And again, in these towns, there are descriptions of when Lincoln's funeral train would, would come through. Um, it would usually travel at night. And so, say, in a little town in western Ohio, you would know that this train was going to come through at uh, exactly 3.35 in the morning. Um, and they actually were able, um, relatively impressively, to keep more or less to the timetable. It was a, an amazing technological feat, that journey. And so thousands and tens of thousands, sometimes, of people would come down and gather at these little depots. And imagine this at a time before artificial light, um, a time before you know, nobody had, had come out in crowds at, at night before and at three o'clock in the morning and they're all gathered and there are bonfires and people are singing hymns and they're, um, they, they, would, they would get up, sometimes a soldier would get up and, and read the second inaugural address, read the Emancipation Proclamation. And so there was this kind of sense of, of catharsis that went beyond just the individual death. 
And in fact, I'll just add that in reading personal writings, diaries and letters, people would say things when the funeral train was coming through or when they were writing about Lincoln, they would often add something like, and I remember my dear son who died in the war in 1862, or I remember my dear brother who died 16 months ago today. So they made those, people made those connections between mourning Lincoln and mourning more intimates. Do we have any questions from students? Um, I have a feeling that we, that we may, and then we'll come back to Dr. McCall, who's a lifelong learner. But uh, is there a student over here? Uh, no students? Was there a, okay. Would you like, you had your hand up then. Two weeks ago at the Morgan Library, I, I had the opportunity to walk around an exhibit of Lincoln's work his handwriting, which was not always easy to read, but nicely typed aside were uh, easy to read cards. The point in the exhibit was made that very early Lincoln uh, and his father disagreed violently about the value of going to school. Lincoln owed his father a great deal of labor. Um, he did get some public education young at a considerable walking cost. But what impressed me was how he was able to borrow books. And he had to go great distances often to be able to do that. So, the, the meaning of self-made man became much more real to me. And the contrast between Lincoln, even as a president with a secretary, is using his own thoughts, his yeah. own language. Today, we built an enormous presidential library. Yeah to people who may or may not have been very good original mm -hmm. writers, because so much of what now comes from the White House yeah, I have to say, you know, last, last night um, I watched, and maybe some of you did as well, the Hillary Clinton announcement video on, on YouTube. And no matter what you, you think of, of Hillary Clinton and where you are on the political spectrum, uh, you know, having been thinking about Lincoln and his ideas a lot lately, when I saw that, I just said, the intellectual poverty of this YouTube video compared to Lincoln's most mundane speech, it was just, it was incredibly, incredibly depressing. And um, yeah, so. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, Lincoln, uh, Lincoln was an extraordinary mind. He was a lawyer, but let's not forget that to become a lawyer in his lifetime, you had to read law with, you didn't have to go to law school. You could just read law books with another lawyer and then you would be yeah. a lawyer. So he undertook, which was quite impressive, but it, he didn't have to contend with application to a law school. <laughs> and I think, you know, I think another point beyond um, Lincoln's writing is that from Lincoln's earliest days and throughout his life, um, he had a special relationship to, to words and to ideas. Um, Lincoln knew that ideas were things, ideas were weapons. He had used the weapon of words and education to defeat the terrible deprivation and, and I mean, really squalid conditions, uh, surroundings into which he was born. Um, and of course, to become a lawyer. And as a, as a lawyer, everyone here who's trained in the law knows that when you're a lawyer, you know that words change lives often for the worse. Words can even take life. Um, in the law. And Lincoln also, and I think it's a salient fact of his life that um, often gets ignored, Lincoln lived his entire life within 50 miles of the Mason Dixon, of the line between freedom and, and slavery. He never lived more than 50 miles away from the border between a slave state and a free, and sometimes including in Washington, living on the slave side of that line. And that line, you know, as part of my journey, I, I, I went and I hiked across the Mason-Dixon line right along the railroad um, line, the railroad right-of-way where Lincoln's train passed. And it was remarkable. Of course, I've crossed it many times, you know, driving up I-95 or whatever, but just walking across it, I was struck by 
This line does not exist on the landscape. It's not a mountain, it's not a canyon, it's not a river, it's not a wall. And yet, that line made of words and made of laws was as powerful as any barrier in the world. And Lincoln knew that. He knew that words kept people in slavery. He also knew that words could erase that line and liberate people from slavery, which of course was his great achievement. And Lincoln's part of his genius with words was that he also used words that angered people and that might have been too moderate for some and too radical for others. And he was willing to do that as a statesman. Kitty By, were you, you had a follow-up to that, and then we have a student asking a question here. Yeah. Um, Walt Whitman is so much a part of our Lincoln consciousness. Um, and I know Lilacs wasn't published right away, but can you talk about how much um, his poetry affected yeah, so the question is about Whitman's poetry and how much it affected his time. So Walt Whitman wrote poem, two poems that are now famous about Lincoln, and he began to write them immediately after the assassination. One is, O oh, Captain, My Captain, and the other is, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. And they're both beautiful poems, and everybody should read them. Walt Whitman was in Washington. He worked at, um, he worked at hospitals in Washington. He visited the soldiers. Uh, he saw Lincoln all the time, and he wrote about seeing Lincoln. And he, I think he really loved Lincoln. I think, I think Walt Whitman would have de described himself as somebody who loved Lincoln and admired him deeply. Um, what I love the most about, well, Oh Captain, My Captain is a beautiful, beautiful evocation of the kind of shock, of the kind of disbelief, and of course the character of the captain is, is the metaphor for Lincoln, who falls down on the deck dead. Um, what I love the most about the Lilacs poem is that um, there's certain imagery that literary figures, all, I'm sorry, literary analysts always point to about the, a certain songbird, etc. But the part I like the best is the part where Whitman makes the point that everyday life goes on in all the houses and the villages. It's not a well-known line, so when, when you read the poem, look for it. And he's making the point that although we will never forget this day and we will come back to it every year and we'll mourn every year, everyday life does still go on. And that's partly because he's talking about the victors. And they were eager to look forward to the future as well as to mourn Lincoln. The Union had triumphed, the nation was going to be reunited, and they were still able to feel that joy even though Lincoln's assassination was such a terrible blow and so devastating. They were still able to look forward with a certain kind of optimism. I think we still have time for one or two more um, questions. Uh, Shane, you had your hand up. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. I look forward to reading your book. Um, I'm curious about the perception of, of Lincoln's assassin right after, after it happened. Well, how did it spread? Did his name spread throughout the South? Or how mm -hmm. quickly did, they, did people find out who the individual was? Yeah. Um, and, and what were the, the large you know, reactions? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Well, don't forget that John Wilkes Booth was a well-known Shakespearean actor. So as soon as he jumped to the stage, people recognized him and knew who he was. So his name was being spread through the crowds. It was John Wilkes Booth that very night. I found this very interesting in reading people's personal responses. Ultimately, people blamed Lincoln's assassination on slavery. And you didn't even have to be an abolitionist to make that point. So many, many people said, it is slavery, slavery. That was a, somebody, somebody wrote in a diary. And this was even before they went to church on Easter Sunday and maybe heard the minister say that. It was slavery who assassinated our president. Below that, in a more concrete sense, was a sense that the Confederate leadership was responsible. But then, people did not exempt John Wilkes Booth. So there was a great deal of blame and anger directed toward Booth on the part of Lincoln's mourners. Union soldiers would write in their diaries. They would sit around the campfire and imagine what they personally would do to Booth if they captured him. And the, what they write are, it's very, very gruesome. If you can imagine the most gruesome kinds of descriptions. These men imagine themselves torturing Booth. Um, and then the other point, which is really interesting, is Confederates. Their response to Booth was very interesting. On the one hand, they called him a hero. They said, he's welcome to come to the South, he's escaped, we'll welcome him here, he will be safe here. But on the other hand, Confederates didn't want to be blamed as a whole for the assassination. So at the same time as they say, we'll welcome Booth here and he's our hero, they're very clear that he's a lone madman who acted by himself, he has nothing to do with us, and we're infuriated 
that the federal government would think that we, the Confederate people, had anything to do with it. Very contradictory. And yet, those are the two kinds of contradictory responses that you see in people's diaries and letters from the white South. Y'all come on down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Right. Actually, his final resting place is in Springfield, although not for want of um, <laughs> trying on, on the part of some people, because, yeah, you allude to the fact that, um, yeah, around uh, the turn of the century, Lincoln's, Lincoln's body was actually removed and sort of kidnapped by some um, highly incompetent grave robbers, and then the body was put back into the ground, and um, people actually had an opportunity to, to see Lincoln's body. The coffin was opened and people looked to sort of check that he was still in there. And um, I think that the, yeah, and they, you know, of course they said he was in a remarkable state of preservation. <laughs> I don't know, compared to what, but, um, but in fact, the, the last person to have looked at Lincoln's face died relatively recently because it was somebody who was a little kid in 1908 or whenever it was who had, who had been there for this brief reopening of the coffin. But it's interesting because I was, I was in Springfield um, this summer and of course I went to, and Springfield, how, how many of you have been to Springfield, Illinois before? Um, well, if you haven't gone, it's a remarkable place. There's so many things that are amazing about, like going to Lincoln's house and seeing that this really modest little middle-class house, it wasn't even the fanciest house on the block, let alone in town. Um, and you see the stove that Mary Lincoln cooked at. Her, I mean, this was not Monticello, it's not Mount Vernon, it's not even James Buchanan's house, Wheatlands in Pennsylvania. Have any, any of you vis besides me visited James Buchanan's house? Awesome, okay. <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't too many. Um, but, uh, but anyway, the other thing, of course, you go to Lincoln's tomb, and it's been remodeled several times, and the current version is this sort of third-rate Art Deco version. You feel like you're kind of in the, in the lobby of an office building or something. There are all these inscriptions about Lincoln, not one of which mentions the Emancipation Proclamation. It's, it dates from 1932, and you can, imagine, you can imagine why. But I mean, literally every detail of, of Lincoln's life, it says, you know, he was a sergeant in the Black Hawk War. Yeah, and <laughs> not mentioned. Um, so I, I find it a little bit of a sort of a sad and disappointing place, and I actually end my, end my article with talking about um, where and how I would personally rather see Lincoln buried. So for those of you who haven't read, I won't spoil the ending. Uh, yeah. You both probably have done a lot of readings from Lincoln right up before he was assassinated. I wonder if he had any prescient writings about what he thought Andrew Johnson would do after he was gone, as far as not only reconstruction, but trying to mend or not mend the huge gap that now developed between the Confederacy and the Union. Question rings from Lincoln himself? From Lincoln himself. Well, he didn't know, of course, that Andrew Johnson was going to succeed him, but... Well, two things. First, there, there are legends that the assassination, but in fact, there's a scholar now who's tracing back every instant where somebody recalls that Lincoln had a dream that he was going to be assassinated and following every footnote back, and it does seem to be something that's fabricated. But Johnson is a really interesting point because, of course, Lincoln had chosen Andrew Johnson as his running mate in 1864, the second time he ran for president. His first vice president was Hannibal Hamlin, who was an abolitionist from Maine. Johnson, of course, was a Southerner, and he had been a slave owner. He was from Tennessee. He was the only senator who stayed in Congress after secession. Um, in all the reading I did about Lincoln's writings up to the point he was assassinated, I never saw anything he wrote about Johnson. The most interesting point I came across in reading personal responses about Johnson was that white mourners thought that Johnson was going to treat the Confederates with an iron fist, and some of them, even the most radical whites, were relieved that Lincoln had been assassinated. African Americans knew from the start that Johnson would not be their friend, given his background, um, 
As I always say, Johnson was known as hating the Southern aristocracy, and that's why people thought he would be very harsh on the former slaveholders. But as African Americans understood, he did hate the Southern aristocracy, but he hated black people more. And that was the main, you know, you asked the question about what would have happened had Lincoln lived. We don't know, but we do know that Lincoln would not have treated African Americans the way Johnson did. And when, he was, when Lincoln was assassinated, African Americans went to the White House, they sent in petitions, they specifically said to Johnson, think about how your noble predecessor would have treated us. And then, with Lincoln gone and Lincoln the martyr, African Americans and their white allies were able to invoke him and what they imagined his actions would be to say he would have given us the vote. And in a way it was a strategy and in a way it was what they believed would happen, that they held up Lincoln after he was no longer here to say he would have acted as a radical. Yeah, I, I do think that um, it's, of course, it's hard to say what, what would have happened, but um, Lincoln as president had really developed into, to, to quote another famous American leader, a uniter, not a divider, um, and was, was remarkably skilled at that. And I think that the Johnson presidency was, was characterized not just as, as Martha said, by, by Johnson's betrayal of African Americans, but also by the radical Republicans pushing back very, very hard against that and just an extremely contentious time in which African Americans were sort of between the hammer and the, and the anvil. Um, and I think that Lincoln probably would have, um, be, I, I would like to think he would have been able to moderate that conflict to some degree and be able to speak to, to, speak to both sides a little bit. We, we just don't know. Better um, than Johnson a, would have, however. Certainly better certainly. than Johnson uh, would have. Now there was um, another hand here in the back, you've been weighing patiently. I can say about that because I haven't researched it and I'm, I'm not old enough to have remembered is that many, many places in which I've spoken about mourning Lincoln, people bring that up. So there's clearly a very interesting parallel going on there. The words were almost exactly how right. I heard, heard my late mother and other mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. talk about the world ending mm -hmm. and the animosity mm -hmm. towards Roosevelt mm -hmm. was almost right. as great. The only other uh, death that I, death of a statesman I talk about in the book that I did some research on is, is Garfield, who was assassinated in 1881. Um, quite different, and yet at that moment, I followed up some of the mourners, uh, some of Lincoln's mourners up to that time, up to 1881, um, were also quite devastated by Garfield's assassination. We don't remember it in the same way. It wasn't the same kind of moment at the end of a civil war, but at that moment, there was a tremendous amount of mourning and devastation. Well, uh, I think we have to wrap things up, but I, I, um, I hope that everybody will um, spare a few minutes or maybe even more than a few minutes to think about Lincoln um, in the next 24 hours or so. And if you, if you want to, I would, I would just recommend that you read something by Lincoln, one of the great texts, the Gettysburg Address, the second inaugural, or even one of the less well-known texts like his speech at Independence Hall, his farewell to his friends and, and neighbors in, in Springfield, Illinois. Um, it's just his, his words are so vital and, and vibrant, and Lincoln himself is one of those figures who sort of like a great book that we can go back to generation after generation and read and reread and find new things and argue about and reinterpret. Um, that's who he is, and uh, so I, I hope that you'll spare a moment for him tomorrow on the terrible anniversary. Thank you.